uh, you very rightly pointed out the the very big threat that is emerging out of the right wing extreme is a movement RWE, and you uh, you just said that uh, you're not sure about India, but let me tell you one thing: we have it all. I mean, we are <laughs> suffering it, suffering from it day and day. We, we had riots uh, this year in February in which come some 30 people died, Hindu yeah. Muslim riots, and everything was sparked by you know right wing extremism, yeah. and. Uh, yeah. You mentioned about the cow vigilantes and groups like that. These are all a result of the right-wing extremism yeah. that is that has emerged in the last uh, mm-hmm. couple of years. So yeah, moving ahead uh, with my next question, sir. So, sorry, before you uh, do that, um, I, I, you, you made an interesting comment. So in India, you use the term right-wing extremism to uh, to describe Hindu extremism. Is that that's the terminology that you use? No, 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 no. Academically, we use it. Academically, we use it in in scholar ways, but. Uh, in our particular language, uh, uh, I mean, even if we have to address this issue in English, we just uh, use it like Hindutva, Hindutva propaganda. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Actually, Thank the, you. The problem is, uh, the problem is, uh, so there's this uh, controversy which erupted recently, uh, not very recently, a year back. So when someone used the term for Hindu terrorism, and this is right wing groups started protesting saying that Hindus cannot be terrorists. So uh, <laughs> a safer yes. term people use right wing uh, extremism, a safer term. No, no. Uh, well, thank you for that clarification. I, I, I do understand. I mean, I, I do follow Hin- uh, Indian politics to some extent. I know about the BJP and the RSS and I know the influences. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very, very aware that there is a uh, there's a constituency in your country that is, is very violent and very intolerant in nature. Uh, and but I understand there's also a lot of um, sensitivity about about language. And let, let me just assure you, uh, as a Canadian, we we constantly have this debate about what to call things, because we, we we don't want to we don't want to offend anybody. You know, Canadians have a, a reputation for being a very apologetic people. We're always saying sorry to everybody, um, <laughs> and it seems to me that um, uh, yeah, there's, there's this joke I'll, I'll share with your your listeners. Um, if you're in a crowded room or, or, or you're on a bus or a subway, uh, how do you find the one Canadian in the crowded room? You bump into everybody and the first person to say sorry to you is a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a great debate about terminology and I, I understand that you're having the same debate in your country as well. So that, that's interesting. So anyway, anyway, sorry, you can go to the next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Thank you, sir. So, um, uh, coming back to what we were discussing uh, previous to this, the lone wolf attacks and how homegrown terrorists uh, operate. Recently, what we have, what we have seen, in light with the incident that was going in France, contemporary to that, the Vienna shootings took place, the Quebec uh, knife attack took place. Mm-hmm. So, are is this are these attacks a new wave of jihadism, or these are in the same flow of how lone wolf attacks took place as we discussed in the previous part that happened in London, uh, Sweden, Stockholm, or uh, Barcelona, etc. Or even nice, nice. I mean, in France, yeah. uh, I wouldn't say they're a new phenomenon because we've been seeing them for the better part of the last twenty years. I think that when you talk about terrorism, um, the the critical part is what is the that particular individual or group's capabilities. So, um, for example, in a country like the United States with a very high degree of gun ownership. It is easy for a shooter to acquire an automatic weapon. Think about the, the school shoot, excuse me, the school shootings. And I say, think about the attack in Las Vegas at the hotel. And was it 2018? They never found out what his motive was. I mean, the individual killed 50 people. He wounded 500 people from that hotel in Las Vegas. And then he killed himself. I mean, it wasn't a terrorist attack because they couldn't prove the motivation. It was just a mass shooting of which the United States, unfortunately, has a lot of them. So it really comes down to what can the individual get access to. And as I said earlier, what Islamic State is saying is that you don't have to get an automatic weapon. Just drive your truck down the road or your car down the road or get a knife from your kitchen table or go out and buy a machete or take a club. I mean, the the, the attack I referred to in the hardware store earlier in Canada in 2018, the original weapon was actually a golf club that she picked up from the, the golf section of the hardware store. That's what she started swinging at people at first. So it's not a new phenomenon. It's something which which people, they will adapt according to the circumstances. So this so this is why I'm really, I'm, I'm really very careful and not saying this is a new trend. It's actually an old trend that simply is repeating itself. And, and I think sometimes we're guilty of over analysis 
in trying to figure out, uh, you know, are what we're seeing today significantly different than what we saw yesterday? Sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. So getting back, you mentioned about the, the, the knife attack in Quebec City. That does not appear to have been a terrorist attack because there was no ideological motivation behind it. This was an individual who, and again, this is very early days, but the initial police information is that this person had serious mental issues, uh, had indicated several years ago a desire to kill people. So what was going on with that person psychologically, we don't know yet, but there's been no indication so far that the attack, which took place on Halloween, uh, was actually a terrorist attack. And again, I go back to my earlier point, right? Not all acts of violence are terrorism. And I think we have to be very, very careful in not ascribing a terrorist motivation to what is just a, a terrible act of crime. Um, the vast majority of crimes have nothing to do with terrorism. There are simply acts of violence carried out by people for any one of a hundred different reasons. Um, but no, the tactics are going to evolve sometimes. Maybe we've made it harder. I mean, we've made it harder to fly planes into buildings, right? I mean, think of getting on an aircraft now. It's almost impossible. You go through nine levels of security. So those days have seemed to have gone and people are simply uh, availing themselves of the technology that they can use, again, with the encouragement by groups like ISIS that are constantly saying, again, Nike terrorism, just do it. You know, take a knife from your drawer and walk into a cafeteria or walk into a food court or walk into a, a you know, a, a celebration in, in, in a city center and just start stabbing people at random. That's what the terrorist groups are advocating. And that's what the terrorists are listening to. Um, so thank you for uh, uh, giving that uh, detailed answer. So I have something uh, a follow up on that. Of uh, so initially, when uh, if you go back to the third wave of terrorism, we have seen more hijacking. Uh, then we slowly, when we come to the fourth stage, we have seen more IED blasts. Uh, we have uh, now. Uh, I mean, we don't have people don't have to even have to travel to the caliphate to actually carry out. Uh, like to get combat training and then come back here. Uh, it's just you decide to take out, as you mentioned, a knife from your kitchen and you go and stab people. Uh, how uh, dif difficult does it become for intelligence community to intercept such attacks? Yeah. Because you do not know, because anybody, because you do not stockpile uh, explosives, right? Uh, and you can actually intercept an attack like that. How difficult does it become? Uh, yeah, the, great question. Uh, and the answer is it's very, very difficult. You can put restrictions on um, precursors for IEDs. So let's say you need X, Y, or Z to create uh, an IED. Well, you can put limits on that. You can put limits on firearms. So in Canada, for example, in the wake of a mass shooting uh, in 1994, so 25 years ago now, we, in, we enacted very strict laws. Canada has very strict firearm ownership laws. You can't just go into a store and buy a firearm. You have to get a license. You have to be approved. Unlike the United States, where you can go to, you, you pick up an AR-15 with your groceries, it seems, right? It's as simple as that. The problem with the the the, 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 the simplicity of knives or cars is you, you're not going to ban cars because cars are used in terrorist attacks. You're not going to ban knives because knives, is, I mean, how are you going to cut your, your meat without a knife? I mean, you, you can't do that. So I, I, I think from a, from a security intelligence and law enforcement perspective, it becomes next to impossible because if anything can be used in a terrorist attack and you can't control everything, therefore you have to acknowledge the possibility that something will happen. So let, let, let's say, for example, let's say you decided to, let, let's say you ban knives and cars. It's not going to happen, but let's just, as a thought experiment, you ban knives and you ban cars. So now someone takes, in my country, a hockey stick or a baseball bat. Or you ban though, you ban hockey sticks, you ban baseball bats. So now what I do is I cut a branch off a tree in my backyard. You know, a branch about, you know, this big. So what's that, about uh, 15 centimeters wide? And I hit somebody over the head with a branch. So now I start banning branches. Now I start banning trees. Well, now I'm going to use a fence post. Now I start banning fence posts. You see what I mean? I mean, I'm getting into the ridiculous here. But this I is, mean, this in is... my country, Phil, they would have taken swords. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and so... Mm -hmm. That, see, th that is a reactive policy. We'll wait until somebody does something, and then we'll ban what they use. So again, going back to air, 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 airliners, yes, you're right. In the 1970s, 1960s, that was the golden era of hijackings because there was no airline security in the 1970s. You just walked on a plane, nobody cared. Well, that changed after 9-11. Then you remember the, um, 
You must remember the, um, oh God, what was it? The explosive plot in 2007, 2008, that was, it was they were either trying to smuggle um, uh, bottles of, uh, of soft drinks onto the aircraft that were actually chemicals. Now you can't carry liquids on a plane, right? Anything over 100 milliliters, you can't get, they changed that law. But that was reactive to the plot. And then, of course, we had the underwear bomber in 2009. So what, you're going to ban underwear from what aircraft? I mean, it, it gets ridiculous, right? Um, so I think we have to educate our publics that as good as we are at identifying terrorist plots and terrorists, some will always get through, no matter what you do. And, and yet, I think we live in a world where the expectation is 100% success, which is impossible. Whether it's crime or terrorism or, or disease, you know, think of the COVID virus. I mean, you know, it was bound to happen. We all knew this was going to happen. We all knew there'd be an epidemic of a global scale at some point. You do the best you can. You learn from your mistakes and you try to do better next time. But this expectation that you're going to stop everything is, is a fool's errand. It is simply impossible the way that the, the way that we function as human societies, unless we want to live in a state where nothing is acceptable. And I don't think anybody, especially those of us that live in democracies, want to live in a state where you're being monitored 100 percent of the time. And it's impossible for you to move without the state knowing that that to me is not the kind of world I want to live in, which means we have to accept there'll be a certain rate of failure when it comes to violent extremist attacks. Um, Bottom line is you cannot prevent everything because people just go to the next thing. So, yeah, they went from hijacking airplanes to building IEDs. Now, IEDs are still a big thing in Afghanistan. There's still an attack a day in Afghanistan using IEDs, at least one a day. Similarly in Iraq and Syria. Um, similarly in Somalia. I mean, Al-Shabaab has been carrying out IED attacks in Mogadishu about one a week for the past 15 years. So that hasn't gone away. But if it were to go away, they move on to something else. Like I said, cars, baseball bats, cricket bats, uh, hockey sticks, swords, uh, knives. You can't stop them all. It's an unrealistic expectation that you can stop them all. I, 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 it's, a, it's a very pessimistic answer to your question, but I do think it's a realist answer to your question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so there has been a lot of talks about trying to like, uh, manage terrorism through a holistic approach. And a lot of people have spoken about how de-radicalization work at the same time. Uh, I was actually I actually read your book, uh, and you also mentioned uh, how de-radicalization. Uh, you, I think you talk about de-radicalization in prison actually in your book. Uh, if I'm not wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, it was when religion kills. It, it it was your book. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> when I was reading it, uh, this, this thought comes to my mind. A lot of this uh, terrorist. Uh, uh, have been actually been radicalized in prison mm-hmm. themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and is a radical a de-radicalization actually possible? Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times people do go back to the thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it about de-radicalization or should we actually look for trying to integrate more of a sense of like trying to alter the thinking process, not giving up actually, but actually trying to alter the thinking process? Yeah. Because you cannot change a person's ideology, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, again, the, 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 you're asking such great questions this morning. So uh, let, let's look at radical. Uh, let's look at the spectrum of radicalization. So in a, in a perfect world, you would prevent it from happening in the first place. Well, how do you do that? Well, that's a, that's a very, very complicated question. It has to do with, you know, integration issues. It has to do with, um, doing what you can so people feel part of society. They don't feel alienated. They don't feel marginalized. And by the way, those are overly simplistic terms. Not every terrorist is marginalized. Not every terrorist is impoverished. Not every terrorist is, uh, you know, doesn't feel part of society. Many, many do. This is what I wrote in my first book, The Threat From Within. It, you know, it comes from all different parts. But still, you want to create the conditions under which somebody doesn't think that terrorism is a, a viable option. They're not going to go down that path. They won't radicalize. That, that, that's what you want to achieve to the best of your ability. If a person is showing early signs of adopting violent extremist ideologies, then we enter what's called CVE, countering violent extremism. And there's a whole bunch of initiatives around the world. You know, there are counseling sessions and there's, you know, education programs and things like that. Some successful, some not so successful. If you're dealing with people who are already heavily radicalized, who have already committed an act of terrorism, or who were arrested before committing an act of terrorism, 
Now you're talking de-radicalization, okay? That's a very, very difficult thing to achieve. And I've been on record of saying that um, it's not that I deny it's possible. I just have no idea how you measure whether or not what you're doing has, has had success. And I'll give you a very, very good example. The Vienna terrorist went through a de-radicalization program in Austrian prison. And Austrian officials have admitted that they let him go because he told them he no longer believed in the ideology that got him arrested in the first place. They now know he lied. They now know that he fooled the system. And now people are dead as a result. So you can imagine what, what this is going to do for the Austrian de-radicalization program. It's going to put it under great scrutiny. People are going to question whether or not it works. And that's a valid question to ask. What, there's another term that, that people use occasionally um, that is confused with de-radicalization, but it's quite different. It's, it's, it's the, the term disengagement. Disengagement is not de-radicalization. Disengagement means I may still hold some of the same ideologies that got me here in the first place, but I've decided I'm not going to act on them. Now, disengagement is much more easily detectable than de-radicalization. Why? Because disengagement is whether or not you actually do something. And I can measure that. If you say you've disengaged from terrorism and you don't commit an act of terrorism, that's a pretty good indication you have, in fact, disengaged. Deradicalization suggests you no longer hold certain thoughts and certain ideologies. Now, I don't know what you guys have in India, whether or not you have machines that read people's brains. I mean, this is not Star Trek of, you know, the year 2400. We don't have that technology yet. So what is, how do you determine if a person truly has decided to reject an ideology or the person is just telling you what you want to hear, which is exactly what happened in Vienna and what happened last year in London, by the way, United Kingdom. There was a gentleman who was part of a de-radicalization program, was actually let out of jail and was doing an event with his colleagues and he killed them. He killed two de-radicalization programmers. So he had lied about his de-radicalization. He re-engaged. The problem with, with disengagement is that you can re-engage. But that can be detected by following people if you have the resources. I have no idea how you measure somebody's de-radicalization. So I am, I'm a skeptic. And, I, and again, I don't say this to demean or to um, be cruel to those who to develop and administer these programs. I think they're doing the best job that they can, but these are very, very difficult programs to deal with. And there's no guarantee that they work. And my fear is, and you, you gentlemen know this as well, in the aftermath of an attack in which a so-called de-radicalized person was responsible, it's gonna cast doubt on every de-radicalization program around the world. Now the Singaporeans, have a successful program that I've seen. It's, it's what they call their Religious Rehabilitation Group, RRG. I met with them when I was in Singapore. Uh, the Danes have a, uh, in Denmark, have an uh, example, the, the so-called Aarhus model that they've adopted seems to be successful. But again, I've said it before, you're only as good as your last failure. And it seems to me that we've had some failures recently. And as a result, people are gonna be distrustful of de-radicalization efforts. Uh, they'll, still, they'll still continue but these people have a lot of work to do to convince the rest of us that this stuff actually works in the wake of what happened in Vienna. Uh, one thing that you said really hit my mind. Only, uh, you are only as good as your last failure. See, it's a lot about how spies agencies work, that they are known by their uh, failures, but not by their successes. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Um, the greatest success you can have is never, no one ever notices. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Many, many years ago, uh, we came across an individual who was online, who was um, seemed to be supportive of uh, certain causes. And um, we decided to do an approach of, you know, knock on the person's door and say, hi, um, here's where we are. We know exactly what you're up to. We know exactly what you're doing. Uh, you might want to stop before it's too late. We're not going to arrest you. We don't have enough to arrest you right now. But if you continue doing this, it's going to end very badly for you. You'll either end up in prison or whatever. And interestingly, it seemed that the person got the message. Now, this is not public information. 
I'm sharing with you something that was never made the public. As it turned out, um, the person did appear to understand what we were saying and decided to stop doing it. Uh, unfortunately, six years later, the same person went back <laughs> to the same material. So the person seemed to get six years and then decided to, to return to previous activities. So even there, uh, it was only a partial success. Um, I don't know what happened to that person. I really have no idea. But there's an example of something which was, which was initially a success story, which never made the newspapers, never made the media, never made the internet. Um, and, and, you know, for those of us who worked in that business, you accept that most of your successes will be successes that nobody else but you know. That's just, that's part of the, the cost of doing business. And um, I wish that more Canadians knew about the success stories, but you have to be satisfied that you, you yourself know that you were successful and the government knows you were successful. The average person does not, but uh, in a perfect world, we'd all be uh, informed, but alas, we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, let me just bring back a little bit about what you mentioned about radicalization. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's this uh, report, I think, by Rand, uh, uh, I think it was compiled by Angel Rabasa. Okay. And uh, in, uh, in 2013, they put out uh, this thing that there's there's a process in which an extremist comes to renounce violence and also leaves a movement and reject a worldview. Like the same process, there's a way through which you become an extremist in the first place. Uh, in this context, do you agree with the statement, first of all, is my point. And the other point is, there's a uh, since you mentioned about disengagement, there's also something called dis dismobilization, which is mm -hmm. very different from uh, de-radicalization. Yeah. Uh, if you have to rank in order, uh, whether will you go for a disengagement, dis uh, mobilization, or de-radicalization? If you have to, if there's an uh, inmate uh, which uh, which has committed a crime. Mm. Wow. Um, the one thing we know about radicalization to violence is it's it's a very individual process. I mean, there are some commonalities. The commonalities tend to be in terms of the um, things that people do and things that people say. This is how you know they're radicalized but their own individual pathway is very individual. They all get there by different ways. And so I, I, don't, I don't think there's any one model. There's no one pathway. There's always multiple pathways. So I, I, don't, I don't agree with people that say, I've discovered the magic formula for, for radicalization. It doesn't exist. So if there's no magical formula for radicalization, there's no magical formula for de-radicalization. It's as individual as the initial process. Yeah, this, this distinction between disengagement, demobilization, and, and de-radicalization, it's a really interesting question. Um, Ideally, we want de-radicalization because as long as the ideology still occupies part of your brain, uh, it can affect you at some point. So if we can extract, I'm thinking, you know, like, you know Harry Potter, right? If we can take a wand and, 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 and take your, your thoughts and put them in a pen sieve uh, and get rid of them, maybe that's a way, but that's not going to happen. Harry Potter is not real in case you think it is. It's fiction. Um, De disengagement is good in that um, at least we know you're not going to do anything for the time being. But again, if you've disengaged without de-radicalizing, you can re-engage if something happens. And I certainly have seen that. Demobilization is not a term I've come across a great deal in, in, in my work, but it certainly seems to suggest to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you must know more about the term than I do, Demobilization seems to suggest that you've decided to leave a particular group and that you're no longer part of that group, which is good, right? The fewer members that a group has, the better. But what happens if you demobilize, but then become a lone actor? <laughs> In other words, um, you haven't de-radicalized, you've demobilized, which means you've kind of disengaged but rather than rejoining the group you belong to in the first place, rather than re-mobilizing, you simply re-engage and do something on your own. I get it. It all comes down to the only guarantee that somebody is not going to commit an act of terrorism is if they don't radicalize in the first place. That's the only thing that we can say is a 100% guarantee you will not have it. If terrorism is defined by ideological political or religious motivation, that is the process of radicalization. So you're not going to become a terrorist is if you don't radicalize in the first place. If you're already radicalized, then we're into the de-radicalization sphere. 
And we've already talked about how that's very difficult to measure. So I, yeah, demobilization is great, as is disengagement. But if it's not accompanied by true, true de-radicalization, as difficult as that is to measure, you can remobilize or you can re-engage. That would be my concern in that regard. Okay, that's good. All right. So, uh, in terms of disengagement, uh, I have one question regarding the disengagement which is going in Afghanistan slash in Doha, Qatar. The disengagement in terms of Taliban and the United States, which happened in February, the withdrawal peace agreement. I would rather call it a withdrawal agreement, not a not a peace agreement. And thank you. Uh, <laughs> and what is happening right now in Doha when the intra-Afghan negotiations are going on? Parallel to that, what we see on the on-ground uh, scenario, the thing is that violence has erupted quite a lot, especially in the last quarter. Yeah. Not just military targets, but non-military targets yeah. have also been targeted, uh, especially like the recent Kabul University attack in which some yes. two dozen students and teachers, faculties, uh, uh, even security members were killed. So you said in the beginning of the session that if you want to follow terrorism, you need to follow updates of, on Afghanistan. And on a very personal level, I follow updates on Afghanistan on every hour, not even daily. Yeah. So uh, in that in that particular sense, what are your personal uh, assessment of how Afghanistan's future looks like post-US withdrawal? Yeah. And why is it important for the globe to follow what is going on in Afghanistan? I'll give you a one word answer. The future of Afghanistan is bad. <laughs> Um, the the, the so-called peace talks <clears throat> between the United States and, and the Taliban are simply a cover for the fact the Americans want to withdraw U.S. forces from Afghanistan. It, it, it's not more complicated than that. And in all honesty, they've been there for 20 years. Um, the situation has not improved in Afghanistan. U.S. forces are not going to solve it. Um, so I understand the desire by the Trump administration to remove forces, because one of the problems with terrorism is that when you send your forces to a different country, that is often the, the reason why terrorism arises. Islamic State did not was only created after the American invasion of Iraq in 2003. It's as simple as that. Al-Shabaab was created only after the Ethiopian invasion of, of Somalia in 2005. Al-Qaeda arose only after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. So foreign troops are a major cause of terrorism in the first place. I think what the Americans are doing, uh, talking to the Taliban, is disingenuous. Uh, it simply is, as I said, a cover because they want to get out anyway. The Taliban are a terrorist group. The Taliban are working with Al-Qaeda. Uh, they have their own problems with the Islamic State in Khorasan province, in, in Nangarhar and other parts of the country. So there are there are multiple actors in Afghanistan. As you mentioned, Sadat, the, I mean, the violence is increasing in Afghanistan, has it for the past quarter. You mentioned the Kabul University attack. I mean, it's terrible what's happening in Afghanistan. It's only going to get worse for the simple reason that the Afghan government, the legitimate Afghan government, cannot defeat the Taliban. And it cannot defeat the Islamic State affiliate in, 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 uh, in Nagarhar, the Islamic State in Khorasan. What so that, that means... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you uh, continue, sir, continue. Uh, so what this means is that if the Americans were to withdraw the vast majority, if not all of their troops, I would predict that the Taliban stand a very good chance of regaining power in Afghanistan, which means we're back to, what, 1994, when the Taliban ran Afghanistan. And I remember those days, I'm sure you do as well. Uh, Afghanistan was not a good place to live for women, for children. Uh, it was a very, uh, it was a terrible state. Whether or not the Taliban, they promised not to allow any terrorist group to use Afghanistan as a base for attacking other countries. I, I consider that promise to be an empty one. Uh, they did it once. Why won't they do it again? To me, the Taliban are a throwback to the Middle Ages in terms of their ideology, their treatment of people. I see no reason to trust them now. Uh, that's a very pessimistic scenario. I apologize for being so pessimistic on a lovely Friday afternoon here in, 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 in Canada. But that, that's a realistic one. I'm not saying that you're, you're going to see another 9-11 that's going to come out of Afghanistan, but they will certainly uh, foster terrorism within Afghanistan. Uh, they will also foster terrorism within Pakistan. Uh, and then, of course, you you guys in India, you have your own problems with Pakistan, with what's happening in Kashmir, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see the U.S. I, well, I, underst I understand the politics behind U.S. troop withdrawal. 
I, I'm not so naive to think that the withdrawal is going to lead to any kind of stability in Afghanistan anytime soon. Afghanistan will remain an unstable power for the foreseeable future. And as I said, uh, the Taliban stand a very good chance of uh, unseating the government, the, 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 the legitimate government of Afghanistan and becoming, the, you know, again, the power, the power behind the throne. And as I've said, I, I get tired of people call the Taliban militants. They're not militants. They're terrorists. Okay, let's not let's not call them soldiers or militants. They're terrorists, and they're a terrorist group. So we're basically handing the keys over to a terrorist group. I guess we'll, we'll remains to see what happens, but I, I don't see a lot of positive outcome for Afghanistan in the wake of a U.S. peace patrol. And these peace negotiations are a sham. They're they're a complete farce, as far as I'm concerned. Well, uh, that's that's actually very uh, true when you said that Taliban is actually is in the most advantage position, and uh, they are uh, they are definitely uh, operating and negotiating from a point of great power and great yes. uh, ground uh, yes. relevance. But the question again, I mean, uh, uh, in my last, last couple of visits in Afghanistan myself, I've seen how devastated the life is, and but in in the last twenty years with the American presence, there has been a new upsurge in the civil population. There is a very civil population that has emerged, especially in the capital and in the northern provinces of, uh, you know, Mazar Sharif or whatever. Mm -hmm. In the south also, in the southeast, we, in the southwest, we have Herat. These, yeah. these particular zones have witnessed a rise of uh, a very ideal and very open-minded liberal civilian population. So for them, the future looks very bleak. But but how how do we put an end to this conflict? That remains one prior question post the U.S. withdrawal, which has not been answered yet. So everyone has their different assessments. I would yeah. like to know about your assessment on this. Uh, well, I, I want to be careful. I mean, I, I don't consider myself to be an Afghan specialist by any stretch of the imagination. I, I mean, I, I guess the bottom line is, um, I, I think the Afghan people deserve our support still. Uh, the question remains, what form should that support take? I mean, obviously, military occupation has not worked. For the past 20 years i don't know i don't know the answer for afghanistan I, I know that as you've mentioned and you know the situation more than i have i have never been to afghanistan uh i know that people are doing their best efforts to try to create a, a society for all afghans and i wish them well i really do wish you know that they, they succeed unfortunately i you know as you said this the, you use the term brilliantly the, the future is bleak because there are other actors in afghanistan who do not want them to succeed they don't they do not want to see liberalism they do not want to see, you know, uh, girls in schools. They don't want to see women's rights being recognized in Afghanistan. And the powers who are against those freedoms seem to be more powerful than those who are trying to implement those kinds of systems. So I, I don't have an, an easy answer for your question, uh, Sadat. I, I'm sorry. Um, it, it does look like it's almost an intractable, intractable problem. My concern would be is that we get out and then five years later something happens and we go back in. Do we go back in under the same circumstances we went in in the first place in 2001? Do we change our approach? I, I don't know. You know, there's been a, there's been attempts to build civil society. There's been attempts to rebuild the economy. There's been attempts to, you know, build schools and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Schools are still being bombed. Women are still being killed. You talked about the attack on the university. I mean, that to me is very, it, it, it's, it's incredibly symbolic, right? Why would you attack a university in Kabul? Because the university represents everything you hate. You hate education. You hate liberal thought. You hate you hate ways of things of doing things that you don't like, that you are against. And that's why you attack a university. You know the Nigerian uh, Boko Haram. I mean, the Boko Haram in Hausa means you know Western education is bad. We don't want Western education. Well, this is what Islamist extremists don't want. They don't, they don't want anything to do with us. So um, you know. How do you create a system in Afghanistan that recognizes freedom for all? I have no idea. We have been we have been unable to do so over the past 20 years. So what is there out there that suggests we're going to be any more successful tomorrow or the year after? I mean, again, I hate being so pessimistic, but I consider myself to be more of a realist than anything else. And I think that you have to call the situation for what it is. And, and you having been there on several visits, I mean, you've seen this firsthand that there really isn't a lot of optimism for, for positive change in Afghanistan. Uh, so, we'll, I just have last few questions before sure. we end this. So, the first one uh, is I have seen uh, some of your podcasts, and one of the podcasts you mentioned how the Western foreign policy, especially the Canadian foreign policy, needs a redo. Uh, 
so the, and uh, i do agree with you in, this, in that uh, kind of context which you mentioned uh, so do you think firstly uh, the csis in canada needs to be more open uh, and it needs to uh, there are not, as you mentioned in also your conversation there's a lack of communication in the csis and a lot of people doesn't understand the role or the context of csis does it needs to be more open like the cia it is mm. and okay. uh, uh can you take us through uh, what uh, about the thing that you point mentioned of how canadian foreign policy uh, needs to change at this point of time sure. so why is the need of the act okay and so like, one more thing does the canadian government uh, get direct intelligence from csis or does it come through policy makers to the government okay are there layers in between right okay um so uh, again it's important for me to to point out i'm not a foreign policy specialist um Canada is a is a relatively small player on the world stage. I think we do a good job in so far as we do things, but if we don't have the resources like the Americans and and the Brits for example, I've always thought that that you know the Canadian way of looking at things was I'm not it's not superior. I think it's a good way of looking at things. I think we should share some of our experiences and things. I think that that most people welcome when Canada is part of the conversation. And so I would advocate that we are more active in that regard. um with respect to my own organization the former organization the CSIS um again further to the, i think you said that you raised the point earlier i mean it, intelligence organizations are by definition very secretive they don't talk a lot about themselves i've always been very uh, uh very much we should have a conversation this is why i'm doing what i'm doing even though i'm so called retired i do a lot of media in canada talking about security intelligence because my own organization won't do it for itself uh i think we have to tell our story we have to tell what we know to a certain extent obviously when it comes to security intelligence uh ongoing operations sources and methods are always going to be held secret because they have to that's your core business you can't tell everybody you know your secrets otherwise the people that you're trying to follow will find out what your secrets are and they they'll be able to avoid you know being followed kind of thing but i do think there's room for a greater dialogue i think that intelligence is underappreciated in canada I think most Canadians have a very poor idea as to why we have intelligence and what it does for us, what the advantages are. Um and so when you don't when you don't tell your own story, other people tell it for you. And and as a result, uh, some of those people aren't advantageous. They're not your fans. They're not you they, they don't support you. And so they give out very negative stories about who you are and what you do. And that's what happens when you don't when you don't you don't take the the uh the initiative. and and share information with people more widely. So they're getting better slowly. Um like I said this is a secretive business. Intelligence is a is the what second oldest profession according to some people. That that keeps changing, right? We're not sure what the number one oldest profession is, but it keeps changing. But um it it is a very difficult call to make with people, but I I just wish for for a, a much um more honest dialogue. It, even within the Canadian government, intelligence is not always appreciated. um we don't have an intelligence culture like the americans and the united united kingdom does i don't know what 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 happens in india but there are government officials who don't understand intelligence don't know what to do with it uh and as a result don't tend to use it it has its limits it's not perfect but it is part of the puzzle that, that should be at least considered so all this to be said i think there's a, there's a great scope for having a much wider conversation on what intelligence is what it isn't what it can do what it can't do uh and what contribution it can make so i've always been a proponent of a greater canadian presence on the international stage i too have traveled around the world uh as a representative of the canadian government and have always been uh, uh warmly welcomed by people that uh, that i've spoken to we let's face it um one thing we have an advantage and is you know uh, there's no other way of saying this uh we're not americans um you know i think canada has a different reputation and the united states is a great ally of canada and always has been but i think that we can we can say things in certain ways that the americans can't because we're not perceived as having you know having that kind of global agenda uh that the americans often are perceived as having rightly or wrongly so yeah i would agree that i think that canada should be much more active on the international stage uh and have these types of conversations both internally and externally it can only be a good thing it can't be a bad thing as far as i'm concerned i'm not sure if that kind of answers the question but um it it, 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 it is a, it is a it's a work in progress let's put it that way yeah. so this was small follow up on the thing that you said then i'll move on to the last question so the thing is uh, since you mentioned of how you need to get your story right and how you need to put your narrative as well at times before someone else get it because the one who sets 
the story first wins the game yeah. uh, generally uh, yeah. when you're working in the agency uh, and you have to keep your identity as well as your common secret because the operation is secret in nature uh, did it ever feel for you to get out your narrative because often it times get because the government might at the day might blame you for an intelligence failure might blame you that you they didn't get the right intelligence at the right time right uh, does it happen and uh, at times of a special operations or something on a foreign country when you stay uh, and when you have your spies down there uh, how secretive do you have to be to let them stay with their secrets and they do not leak it out to other people about their narrative of their particular version hmm Okay, uh, so the first part of the question, actually, I was a bit of an exception in that um, because I was an analyst and not an officer, I was allowed to actually tell people where I worked because when I dealt with them, um, you know, I was able to sort of compartmentalize the secret part from the non-secret part. So I was often used as, um, as somebody who could sort of tell a bit more of the story. Then, so I wasn't a source handler. I wasn't a surveillance. I wasn't somebody who engaged uh, on, at that level of operations. I was an analyst that looked at things more broadly. So I was able to, to say a lot more than my colleagues were, which is something which I keep doing right now, right? I, I, I openly admit where I used to work and the types of things I used to do, but I had that advantage because I wasn't in, you know, I wasn't knee deep in operations, ongoing operations. Uh, in terms of, you know, operating abroad, I mean, uh, you know, CSIS uh, is allowed to operate abroad under its legislation. Obviously, um, that's a very tricky business uh, you know, obviously, if you're found out, if you're doing something that the country in where you where you're located doesn't want you doing it, it can be really problematic. There are ways to to cooperate with foreign governments so that you can at least share some of the information that you have uh, with the host government. But there are also secretive operations where you're you know you you're you're in a you're in an enemy territory where you're you don't want to share information with the people. You know, we've all seen the movies. Uh, you know, the James Bonds, all that kind of stuff. I think it's a very difficult. Uh, environment to work in um and uh you just do it to the best of your abilities because what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to have somebody killed or, or somebody arrested or somebody whatever because they're doing something they shouldn't be doing it's a it's a delicate balance let's just put it that way and uh it's something which i think all intelligence organizations deal with on, on a daily basis is how to protect their their assets how to protect their resources in such a way that uh, again nobody ends up in jail no, nobody ends up dead uh so let me just ask you the final and the concluding question. Uh, this is from, I read your book, uh, uh, An End to the War on Terrorism, mm -hmm. and I loved it. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, you mentioned how the various approaches and response to international Islamist extremism, and you mentioned of how uh, the various law enforcement and action, the government policies that we need to enhance to actually uh, win the war against terrorism. But, can, uh, but when we actually look on an academic view of uh, so-called winning the war on terrorism. Uh, there isn't any conclusive evidence until unless the uh, the, uh, the people uh, related to the organization actually joins a political party or mm -hmm. gets what they wanted, or you use excessive force. That is also, I think, a survey source. Like seven percent of this only worked before where a military or force actually could uh, crack them down. Mm -hmm. How can we actually win this war on terror? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you for the last question. That's the most difficult one at all. Um, so first and foremost, we have to stop calling it a war on terrorism because as somebody said very famously, you don't declare war against common nouns because common nouns don't surrender. The war on poverty never ends. You can't defeat poverty. Uh, you know, the war on drugs. You don't defeat drugs, right? You declare war on proper nouns because proper nouns can surrender. So we got to stop calling it a war. So to me, as I said in the book, I think there are two primary ways. There is a there is a role for the military, but it has to be very, very constrained. For the reasons I already said, when you send foreign forces into another country to occupy it, that causes more terrorism, not less. So that's not the number one solution. So the solution is, as I said earlier, to prevent ideology from establishing itself in the first place. And that's a question for civil society. Uh, we, you know, all of us have to get together to try to uh, um, eliminate the narrative that, that groups like ISIS put out there to counter it, to give our own narrative, to tell our own stories, which are superior to their story. That prevents it from happening in the first place. If we're too late or people um, in, um, 
digest the narrative anyway, then we're talking about security intelligence and law enforcement. We have to identify people who pose a threat, investigate them, stop them, arrest them, charge them, try them, and incarcerate them. So that, to me, is, are the two major points in, in terms of, of dealing with terrorism. Terrorism is a tactic. It's been around probably forever, although we generally date it from the middle of the 19th century. That's the, mod, the, 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 the age of modern terrorism. So if it's been around for 150 years, there's no sign it's going to end anytime soon. But it's important to point out, and this is the one positive thing I'm going to say to people today. I've been so negative all day. The one positive thing is that in the vast majority of countries around the world, Afghanistan being a, a significant exception, terrorism does not pose an existential threat to any of us. It's important. It has to be fought on different levels. But terrorists are not going to win. Terror Again, Afghanistan is the exception, I think. Terrorists are not going to establish, um, you know, states around the world. We're not going to enter an era in 100 years time where most countries are run by terrorists. They're not. They're going to be the exception, not the rule. So this is important that our, our response to terrorism has to be proportionate to the threat that terrorism causes. We have a much greater threat from pandemics. I mean, hello, COVID-19. Yeah, I, I see what's happening in your country. I see what's happening in a lot of countries. We have threats from drug cartels. We have threats from, from criminality. We have threats from climate change. Climate change is existential. If we don't stop climate change, the world will no longer be the same as it is. Terrorists do not, do not pose an existential threat. They're important. We have to deal with them. But we, let's please not make them more important than they are. And by declaring war on, on terrorism, we, we give it far more importance than it deserves. And that this war on terrorism is a result of 9-11. Had 3,000 people not died on that day in September of 2001, you, we wouldn't have, be having this conversation right now because that has defined the way we look at things over the past 20 years. So Definitely. please, 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 let's not, cause, let's not overthink this and realize that terrorism does not pose an existential threat to us. That's my positive yeah. message for your, for your audience today. Yeah, as a lot of people say uh, that uh, the attackers uh, who were actually attacking the World Trade Center yeah, that day, uh, the attack wasn't the person who were actually attacking the building, but for all those people who were discussing it right now sitting, yeah. they were the yeah. main targets. Absolutely. So that's, that's, a, that's a really good way to end the conversation. <laughs> but since, as I mentioned you uh, initially, that we have a lot of students watching this, and it's basically a, like a lecture, lecture come learning experience. Mm -hmm. So we generally tend to give five reading material, five books they should read. You can give all the five books that you're reading. <laughs> or you can choose to uh, collate uh, some other books as well. Uh, any five books that the students who are watching this should read. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what. I, I want to think about that. Um, so obviously, my five books are the best books ever written on terrorism. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, the, there are a number of books I like to recommend, but but can, can I um, maybe just send you an email today or, or later on today or tomorrow that you can pass on? Because I'd rather get the list. I'd rather get the list right because there 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 have been a lot of good books on terrorism. Um, equally, there are a lot of bad books about terrorism that have been written. The one thing we say about about you know terrorism since 9/11 is that a whole industry was created. A whole industry of experts and everything, and many of which were not, in my humble opinion. So I, I want to give a, 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 a more reasoned uh, answer to your question, but I'll definitely will yeah. give you the top books that I believe that are out there, and I'll send that to you in an email later on today. Sure. Uh, uh, so there's this another, I think, a version that was created called the psychosocial uh, element of actually going and looking at terrorism. I think post 9/11, that was actually created, and whole whole lot of yes. books actually. Yes. Like that was written post that. But if yeah. you could actually show, uh, if you have the books around your five books, if you could just show to our viewers, and if somebody wants to read them, they can actually grab a copy. Yeah. Do or you, you want me to actually? Just, just, yeah. Just give me one second. Yeah. Sure. So this was the first book. So you, if you're interested in homegrown terrorism, this is the best one. This was came out in 2015. This is the threat from within. That talks about radicalization. Okay. What the signs are. I already showed you the second one, which is. Uh, uh, Western foreign fighters. That's all about, obviously, ISIS. Uh, the third one that came out that doesn't get talked about a lot is the Lesser Jihads. And this is looking at where ISIS ended up after 2014, all the affiliates around the world. Okay. Um, the one you referred to on many occasions, of course, is a, an end to the war on terrorism, where I talk about different strategies for dealing with terrorism. And then uh, the most recent one, which came out last year, is uh, When Religion Kills. And this, of course, is looking at uh, all types of religious terrorism, 
not just Islamists, so Buddhist and Hindu and Sikh and Christian and Jewish, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the five books that have come out. Um, I am finishing up a sixth book, which probably will be of yeah. less interest to your students because it's focused exclusively on Canada. I'm looking at, at terrorism in Canada over the past 152 years since our country was created in 1867, looking at different terrorist movements uh, and looking at it through the eyes of the security service. So those of us who worked in counterterrorism, what were we thinking at the time? So that, that book, I'm hoping going to be publishing in 2021. So, so uh, we will definitely love to host you that time when you actually have written the book. Right. Uh, I've actually, I have actually read somewhere of your sixth book. So I would have asked you, but since you have already told me, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, that's but great. Uh, I actually have a funny story to your books because uh, the books here in India actually cost a bomb because they something around like 2,000 uh, bucks in Indian rupees, each of them. Uh, wow. So I asked. I asked a friend actually who studies in uh, uh, Toronto to actually bring to the copies actually a couple of the copies which I actually mentioned I read. Well, thank you for that. That's nice to see. I have a I have a fan base in India. That's, that's something I didn't expect, so I really do appreciate that. You should give more interviews to us. That uh, you will get more uh, have a more fan fan base. <laughs> no, I, so yes. once once COVID ends, I have to come to India and give a lecture in person then. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. I will that's, love that's, to that's a phenomenal idea. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very, very much for, for reaching out to me and arranging this session. I, I hope you found it useful, and uh, I really do appreciate you approaching me. This is a very, this is a very meaningful thing for me. I really do. I, I really want to say thank you to the two of you uh, and to your audience for sticking around for a uh, little more than an hour and a half. It was it was a very stimulating day, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for taking time and actually being on the show. Sure. We had a lovely time. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you.